The Mandalorian has been a much needed hit for Disney, proof that the Star Wars franchise can recover in the wake of the horrific cinematic embarrassment known as the Star Wars sequel trilogy. <laughs> And we recently learned that success will be translating itself to a number of new Star Wars projects, including the direct spin-offs of Ahsoka and Rangers of the New Republic. Though I did start editing this video before Gina Carano posted a picture of historical German tragedy on Instagram. That was a good idea, Gina. Work for the biggest family-friendly company in the world. Let's show Jews running for their lives. So I don't know if that Rangers of the New Republic show is still happening. Point is, despite the Mandalorian's critical acclaim, viewers like myself have been greatly disappointed by one particular element of the show. Namely, the show's insistence on portraying stormtroopers exclusively as drooling morons. But Vito, you might be saying. Everybody knows stormtroopers have always been useless buffoons barely capable of operating their blaster rifles. What's the issue? Well, my idiotic friend, that's what we're here to talk about today. But first, I'm gonna need you to do something for me. You see, my local candy man was recently kidnapped by a rival cartel. And without that sweet, sweet fix, the only thing keeping my heart pumping is the endorphin boost from watching my subscriber count go up. So please, for the love of God, click the button. Daddy's got the shakes real bad. Oh, God. Anyhow, here's what I was trying to say. This idea that stormtroopers have always been nothing more than moronic cannon fodder is simply untrue. And Disney's bizarre insistence on ridiculing the primary antagonists of the Star Wars universe is quickly transforming that universe into a stupid slapstick cartoon. <laughs> Now, to be fair, troopers have been earning a bad reputation ever since the very first movie. In A New Hope, we saw them running away like cowards, missing every blaster shot they fired, and let's not forget this famous trooper who couldn't figure out how to get through this doorway without slamming his head into it. But despite those examples, we also need to remember this was the same movie that opened with stormtroopers successfully overtaking a rebel cruiser. The same movie which demonstrated the Empire's ruthlessness by showing us how a squad of stormtroopers turned Luke's onto and uncle into Halloween decorations. And when our heroes got stopped by a Tatooine patrol, there was genuine tension in that scene. I know the first time I saw that movie, I was honestly afraid that the droids might be recognized. Thank God Luke's grandpa is a space wizard. So where exactly did this perception of stormtrooper incompetence come from? Well, it seems like most people like to point at the stormtrooper's lack of accuracy, with this idea that troopers can't shoot straight being a long-standing in-joke in the Star Wars community. An in-joke that the Mandalorian unfortunately decided to make canon. <laughs> the opposing forces are useless, yay. Now, as we said, this idea of stormtroopers being unable to aim seems to have existed since the very first movie. In A New Hope, we see these troopers in several situations where it seems like they have a very clear shot at our heroes. Perhaps most obviously, in this completely empty hangar bay. Just, just shoot forward and loot their, whatever, you're terrible. Now, of course, our heroes are clad in a bit of plot armor. We're obviously not gonna massacre all the heroes of the story for the mere sake of making the firefight more believable. But thankfully, we don't actually need to make excuses for this scene, as George Lucas wisely gave us a line that explains much of the stormtrooper's apparent lack of accuracy. They let us go. It's the only explanation for the ease of our escape. You see what she said there? The Death Star Stormtroopers were not shooting to kill. Grand Moff Tarkin wanted Princess Leia to escape because he knew that she would lead them straight to the Rebels' secret base. I'm taking an awful risk, Vader. So these decades of jokes about the Stormtroopers' poor marksmanship are based, at least in part, on a complete misunderstanding of the original Star Wars film. Now, obviously, George Lucas didn't help this negative perception of stormtroopers by showing them getting their asses whooped by a clan of teddy bears. George, I know you wanted more merchandise, but teddy bears really? Oh, whatever. But aside from that, I honestly don't think anyone left the original trilogy thinking of stormtroopers as wholly useless morons. Yes, the troopers were just simple foot soldiers, but the audience still understood and feared them. When the troopers stormed Echo Base or took Leia and her friends hostage, we were truly worried for the safety of our heroes. And it was only after decades of stupid stormtrooper jokes that this myth of the mouth-breathing trooper took hold. It's okay that you're here. It's good. 
What I'm trying to say is that despite the occasional misstep, Lucasfilm knew how to write stormtroopers. Then, unfortunately, Disney came along and f***ed everything up forever. All right now, get out there and make me some damn money! <laughs> Now, The Force Awakens honestly looked as if it was not only going to treat stormtroopers seriously, but actually add some depth to these previously one-dimensional characters. In fact, the very first trailer for the movie opened with a scene showing a stormtrooper without his helmet. This was big. This suggested the franchise would finally be offering a more humanized depiction of these otherwise faceless grunts. Then there was Captain Phasma, a character who was insanely hyped up by the film's promotional material. Knowing that Game of Thrones' Gwendolyn Christie was underneath that shiny chrome helmet, fans were excited to see this talented actress show us an elite stormtrooper in action. Hey. Now to be fair, The Force Awakens occasionally got things right. What? 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 Seeing the troopers opening fire on helpless villagers reminded us that these forces can be cold-hearted monsters. And a solid fight scene between Finn and his former comrade showed us that there are troopers who possess serious combat skills. But unfortunately, neither The Force Awakens or the rest of the sequel trilogy managed to actually improve the reputation of the lowly stormtrooper. In fact, they did just the opposite. And you'll drop your weapon? And I'll drop my weapon. <laughs> Former Stormtrooper FN2187, also known as Finn, aka my boy John Boyega, how you doing, John? Occasionally showed glimpses of character depth, but he ultimately came off feeling more like comic relief than a truly fleshed out character. Ow! Hey, what? 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 Okay! I honestly still don't understand how someone forced to train since childhood to serve a brutal military regime would come out of that experience as such a bumbling goofball. I'm in charge now, Phasma. I'm in charge. Bring it down. Bring it down. I always thought it would have made more sense for Finn to be a stoic warrior like Grey Worm in Game of Thrones. Someone cold and distant, constantly battling the anger he feels towards the evil empire who enslaved him. Instead, he just gets friend zoned by this British chick for three movies. <laughs> what a dumb franchise. Then there was Phasma, good old Phasma, whose only contribution to these films was getting blindsided by a Wookiee, <gasps> then thrown into a trash compactor by an elderly man. Trash compactor. This is a lesson, kids. This is why you watch the movie before you pre order the $800 deluxe replica helmet. First, you watch the movie. Then you buy the merchandise, not the other way around. Point is, this was truly a missed opportunity. Humanizing stormtroopers could have added significant depth to the Star Wars universe. Unfortunately, that disjointed mess of a trilogy was constantly at odds with itself. Unable to decide if stormtroopers were tragic soldiers or disposable imbeciles who existed only to be blown to bits. I mean, why on earth? Earth, would you devote multiple scenes to showing us how troopers like Finn and Janna are good people who were forced into service by evil masters, only to then go right back to murdering stormtroopers by the thousands? When I see a Star Destroyer explode in the Battle of Exegol, I don't think, wow, what a great victory against the First Order. I think, oh my god, how many thousands of brainwashed child soldiers did you just kill? What a nightmare! Everyone involved with that trilogy should not be allowed to write movies ever again. Which brings us back to The Mandalorian, a show which unfortunately continues Disney's campaign to utterly destroy the reputation of the common stormtrooper. This second season devoted half its episodes to showing stormtroopers being humiliated. Getting sucked out of an airlock. Crashing their speeder bikes getting murdered off screen while a blue fish man argues with an anti-vaxxer. How long is this gonna take? Look, lady. Or just getting wasted by the intergalactic Spice Girls. Really, really 
Now you may be asking yourself, sure, but why does it matter? Star Wars has always had comedic elements. I don't know where you get your delusions, laser brain. <laughs> <laughs> Laugh it up, fuzzball. So what's the harm in embracing the trope of the moronic stormtrooper and letting our heroes lay waste to these hopeless waves of cannon fodder? Well, the problem is that The Mandalorian bills itself as an action adventure, not a slapstick comedy. And for an action show to work, the enemies have to pose an actual threat to our hero. Otherwise, the action comes off as completely pointless. Now let's be real, obviously our hero's life is never in any real danger. The show is named The Mandalorian after all, and it's highly unlikely Disney would kill off this cash cow before milking every last piece of potential merchandise out of him. But even despite that fact, there should be an honest attempt made to build real tension. Would you craft in the proximity of New Republic Correctional Transport Boston 5? <laughs> to allow the audience to suspend our disbelief and actually worry that our beloved protagonist might be in real danger. When an entire squad of stormtroopers arrive, we should honestly fear for the safety of Mando and his Muppet friend. There should be a sense of actual danger to keep us on the edge of our seats. But that danger never manifests itself because every encounter with stormtroopers ends the same way. Our heroes easily dispatching these plastic clad losers without suffering even a scratch. Hell, we've been shown twice now that even the troopers most powerful weaponry is apparently incapable of damaging our hero. How do, why? That doesn't hurt him at all? Really? Now, I don't know about you guys, but for me, it's gotten to the point where seeing a troop carrier land doesn't inspire excitement, but rather boredom. Because as cool as it might be to see an aging Boba Fett go to town on a pile of stormtroopers, the cartoonish manner in which these foes are destroyed completely ruins the tone of the scene. For me, the return of Boba Fett will forever be sullied by the thought of these useless lemmings getting knocked down like bowling pins. Now, let's be clear, I am pretty darn sure that nobody from the Lucasfilm Story Group watches my channel. But on the extreme long shot that anyone within that half-functioning organization is paying attention, I would like to stress that your portrayal of stormtroopers is becoming a very real problem. And it's a problem that threatens the future of these multiple spin-offs you currently have planned. As such, I would like to suggest three simple proposals for fixing your stormtrooper problem. Number one, no more stupid stormtrooper jokes. Now I understand it must be a lot of fun to write scenes where the moronic space Nazis get sucked out in airlock. And honestly, if these scenes were rare occurrences set in between scenes of stormtroopers doing their jobs competently, the occasional dumb trooper joke would be fine by me. But you've unfortunately packed this series with so many scenes of stormtroopers getting their asses handed to them that it's gonna take a seriously concentrated effort to undo that negative perception. So for season three, and for whatever other Star Wars projects you have planned, I'm begging you, no more stormtrooper jokes. Don't show me stormtroopers crashing into each other or stepping in bantha shit or mistaking their thermal detonator for a sandwich. Whatever stupid stormtrooper joke you were planning, just scrap it, write it down on a piece of paper, save it for another season. I'm not saying you have to get rid of the show's comedy entirely. Absolutely, you can have jokes, but please find some jokes that don't undermine the primary enemy forces of this universe. Why don't you have Baby Yoda eat more unborn babies? No, 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 no. So whatever, just stop with the dumb trooper jokes. Proposal number two, no more invincible Mandalorian. Okay, I get it. Beskar is the adamantium of the Star Wars universe, an incredible rare alloy that lets our hero stand up to even the most punishing abuse. But as cool as it might seem to have an unbreakable protagonist, even Wolverine occasionally gets ripped in half because invincible heroes are boring. I'm gonna rip you in half now. <laughs> that is such a juggernaut thing to say. Oh, 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 oh. As I said in my recent review of Mulan, when a character seems to have nothing at stake, 
there is little reason to root for them. We need to know that our heroes are imperfect, and an important part of that is establishing that they are not immortal, showing the audience that they suffer and bleed like the rest of us. Because let's be clear, Physics exist. Yes, science! I know you guys hate that. I know you like to make up stuff like hyperspacing ships and other ships and hope we're not gonna ask questions about it. But no, there are physics in the Star Wars universe. So while Beskar might prevent a blaster shot from penetrating through the armor, there is still some real kinetic force behind that shot. In the real world, you could be wearing the best goddamn body armor on Earth, but a magnum shot to the stomach is still gonna deliver enough force <gasps> to crack a rib. So there's the round. I do think you'd have tons of internal damage, but a bullet wouldn't go in you. So when the Mandalorian gets shot, it needs to matter. Again, I know you're not gonna kill the guy. I'm not asking you to do that. But when he gets shot 20 times down a short range hallway, that should do some actual damage. How was he not limping for the rest of the episode? You need to communicate that these shots do something. Not to mention that it is so freaking stupid that the stormtroopers miss every single shot fired at our secondary characters. But the second Mando shows up, they start landing numerous direct body shots. Why? Because it looks cool for lasers to bounce off his armor. Okay, yeah, it looks cool, but it's stupid. Why? Why are they suddenly able to aim? Just, just stop this. It's ridiculous. The point I'm trying to make is that having Mando occasionally get damaged by an average foot soldier would not only help reestablish stormtroopers as a viable threat, but it would also go a long way towards helping humanize our hero, reinforcing the show's central theme of a faceless, cold-hearted warrior rediscovering his humanity. Showing Mando in physical pain helps reinforce that he isn't just a stoic badass. That there's a very real human beneath that mask. One who has actual weaknesses. Not to mention, we did establish that Grogu has force healing powers, and a scene showing the weird green rabbit tending to his foster dad's boo-boos could be quite powerful. So yes, Mandalorian armor is cool, but it shouldn't be a magical shield that protects Mando from everything. Heroes need weaknesses, and showing us that the Stormtrooper's weaponry has an actual effect on our hero will return some excitement to these otherwise bland firefights. Proposal three, this is the big one, let Stormtroopers kill people. I know I keep reiterating this, but again, I know the central figures of this show are covered in plot armor. I know you're not gonna kill off the Mandalorian because then you don't have a show. I know you're not gonna kill Grogu because then people will stop buying all that stupid Baby Yoda merchandise. And now that you're giving a spin-off show to Cara Dune and Apollo Creed, I know they're gonna be safe as well. Hey everybody, it's me, Vito Chan. Sorry to interrupt, but I have to remind you that Vito started making this video before Gina Carano compared the treatment of conservatives to that of Jews during the historical German tragedy. That means she's probably not getting her own TV show. Okay, back to the video. So what you need to do is stop being so goddamn precious about secondary characters. You see these two random Mandalorians? Kill one! Just, just shoot one of them right in the face. Remind us that the Star Wars world has actual consequences, and that when you make the reckless decision to try and seize an Empire shuttle with a meager four-man crew, there's the very real chance that something will go wrong. I mean, think about how much stronger this episode would have been if someone had died, if we actually saw our characters reacting to the death of a comrade. Would Bo-Katan pause to consider the ramifications of her reckless leadership, grappling with the knowledge that her pursuit of the Darksaber and the Mandalorian throne will likely lead to even more death and loss? Or would she callously shrug it off, declaring that the importance of recapturing Mandalore outweighs the cost of any lives that will be lost in that pursuit? And how would Mando, who allowed himself to be roped into this mission without knowing its true objective, react to a death he was powerless to prevent? Would he angrily blame Bo-Katan? Or would he empathize with the hard decisions leaders must make in times of war? But there's nothing like that in the episode, because even the most lowly sidekick characters are just as invincible as our main cast. 
It seems kind of ridiculous to me that a franchise called Star Wars seems to think that wars are one-sided affairs where only the bad guys ever get killed. And yes, I know they killed Nick Nolte last season, and I, the what, the IG robot? I must be destroyed. Okay, but keep it up, keep doing that. It's time the show raises the stakes and shows us the Empire's weaponry isn't just for show. Again, you don't have to kill the face characters if you don't want to, but let's start throwing some red shirts into the mix. Captain. So in conclusion, I want to like The Mandalorian. I honestly hope that these numerous new Star Wars projects can help restore this franchise to its former glory. But for me to enjoy these stories, I need to know that the characters have something at stake. I need you to show me that these heroes are not immortal supermen, and that the foes they face are not moronic children who exist only to be humiliated and murdered. I am really hoping that the mistakes of this second season are not repeated in the next and that Disney will learn to treat the series' most recognizable adversaries with a little bit of respect. Perhaps there will even be a day that Disney delivers on the promise of that first Force Awakens trailer, giving us a Stormtrooper character who truly adds some depth to these largely forgettable foes. But who am I kidding? They'll probably just keep f***ing things up. Again, this is the same company that wanted us to cheer for exploding spaceships full of former child slaves. Disney, what are you doing? Oh my, all those dead children. Oh, what a tragedy. Hey everybody, how you doing? This is Vito here, the guy whose YouTube channel this is. Thank you for watching my video. I really appreciate it. I'm really, I'm really glad you're here. I don't know if you're new to the channel. If you are, don't forget to subscribe. Please subscribe. Keeps me going in these dark times. <laughs> I love it. But if you are a returning subscriber, thanks for coming back. I want to apologize. It's been a while since I've done a big video. I'm actually working with some editors now, which uh, makes it easier to get stuff done. I mean, it will make it easier. You know, first we had to coordinate it, which is why this one took a little bit of extra time to get it out. But now hopefully that I have some people uh, helping me work on stuff. Maybe we can make videos quicker than ever before. We'll see. And I want to thank, of course, my patrons who make it possible for me to pay editors to afford my, you know, uh, video editing software, my equipment, everything else. You guys are the ones who make it happen, and I can't thank you enough. If you're interested in being a patron, don't forget, you will get to see the uncensored versions of my videos, including this one, where I, I guess I'm not allowed to talk about actual news stories, things that certain actresses may have said are too controversial to pass the YouTube algorithm, as, as stupid as that is. But if you would like to see the uncensored versions of my videos, other bonus videos and cool stuff, as well as just support my content, do check out patreon.com slash the veto show. As always, we got more cool videos coming soon. Thanks for sticking with me. 2021, it's gonna be, well, it's, 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 not, it's not as good as we hoped it would be. <laughs> it's different. It's getting better. God, I hope it's getting better. Have fun. <laughs>